Well, you may be wondering this morning, Billy, you're talking with a microphone, but it's not on your face. Uh, and that's because I'm not preaching today. So this past week, uh, me and some other leaders, we had this opportunity to fly down to Dallas, Texas, to be a part of Acts 29's national conference. So if you don't know what Acts 29 is, Acts 29 is a church planning network that seeks to plant more and better churches all across the globe. And we have been able to see some amazing things. While we were there, uh, we had we had dinner with a really dear friend of mine. He was in my wedding who is a pastor at a church in Rio de Janeiro. And so just to hear about what the explosion of gospel growth in Brazil, but then also to hear about the explosion of gospel growth over East Asia and in Africa, and then also down in West Virginia or in Mississippi, like hearing about all the things that God is doing all over the place was so life-giving and so exciting. And it reminded me of about five, six years ago, I sat at a Tupelo Honey with a group of pastors in Asheville with this strategic plan for a church plant and said, will you give us money? Um, And this group of pastors, you know, I'm sure the strategic plan was goofy and not perfect, but they really loved on us. And so uh, Steadfast Church, which was Missio Dei at one point, like us, they had a name change from Latin to something people understand. Um, They loved on us so much, guys, in so many ways over the years. Uh, their, Their pastors have prayed for us, encouraged us. And one of those pastors is my friend Mark Knox, who is going to be preaching today. Mark has randomly texted me before and said, hey, I'm in Morganton, let's get dinner. Just to hang out with me and my family and just pray for us and encourage us. They have been dear friends who have loved you. And whether you know any of them or not or have never heard the name, you are blessed because of this church. And so with that being said, it is my delight and privilege to invite Mark up. But before Mark, you come up, let's read God's word. So if you would stand with me as we read from scripture. We're continuing on in our first John series We're going to be looking at chapter 2, starting in verse 3, all the way down through verse 11. 1 John chapter 2. And by this, we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have had. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So Mark, if you want to come on up, I'll pray for you. All right, let's pray together, Mission Church. Holy God, we are grateful for your word. Lord, that you have not left us in the dark, but that true light has radiated through Jesus Christ. God, I pray for my brother Mark now, Lord, that you would equip his heart, Lord, to share what you have put on it. God, that you would ready our hearts to receive from your word. Ultimately, Lord, we pray that the name of Jesus would be made much of this morning. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done and all that you are continuing to do in our lives. We pray all of this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good to be here today. Um, It's always good to go and uh, worship in a new place and hear God's people singing. And it just reminds me of the hymn, uh, Crown Him with Many Crowns, The Lamb Upon His Throne. Hark, how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. And I just love how the anthem that we are all singing together is something that, that uh, encourages us and, and lifts us up. And that's what the Bible tells us to do, is to sing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And it just reminds me that the church of Jesus Christ is worldwide. Um, right now in my church in Asheville, they're meeting uh, 
one of our pastors, Sam, is probably just about right about this moment, getting up in the saddle just as I am. So um, it's just great that God's church can do that. And I'm sure you, you experienced that this week in Dallas with all those, all those guys. So uh, not just guys, but anyway, we are in 1 John, as Billy has just read, uh, chapter 2. Am I truly saved? Do you ever ask that? Do you ever ask that question of yourself? Am I truly saved? The theme for this, this series, as you see here, is that you may know. And it comes from the verse that is, that is displayed over here in, in 1 John 5, 13, where he has written these things so that you who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may know that you have eternal life. But the fact is that all of us who call on the name of the Lord, we sometimes have doubts. We sometimes worry about that. We have anxiety. Sometimes Christians can become quite miserable for various reasons as they despair of having assurance as, as they despair of, of knowing that they know. And this is why John wrote 1 John. My point today is we can know. You can know. And you may be here today um, and for whatever reason, maybe struggling with doubts about your, your state before God, uh, whether, you, whether you stand or fall, uh, and maybe it's because uh, you've allowed yourself to become encumbered by the cares of this world. It may be that you've fallen into sin, as we all do, and it just seems like, I can't get out of this. Maybe I'm not really saved. And I know that this is a, a, a visceral thing for, for so many Christians from time to time. And John was written, 1 John was written to counter that, to give us confidence, to give us assurance. And we're going to dive into that in this passage today, and it won't be the last time as you go through the whole book of 1 John that you'll be covering these things. So we've read the passage. John now turns to matters of instruction based on the doctrine he's given up to this point in, in chapter 1 and the first couple of verses in chapter 2. And he wants to now give assurance to his readers that they have a true knowledge of God. Now one of the issues that John was facing when he wrote this, and this was uh, most likely late in the first century. He was, uh, he was the last living apostle of Jesus Christ. And at that point in time, there was some false teaching beginning to, to percolate in the church. And some of that false teaching is what we call Gnosticism. You may have heard about Gnostic writings and things of this nature. Well, the word Gnostic comes from the Greek word knowledge, and it was because these Gnostics were proclaiming a special kind of knowledge, some kind of mystical knowledge that only the very elite could achieve. And that was what we needed to do, is you need to, you need to have this kind of knowledge. And some of that knowledge, um, the Gnostics kind of differed from, from one guy to the next. But uh, one of the things that they did is they denigrated the physical world. And they felt you need to elevate out of the physical world. It was a very mystic uh, kind of thing. And they were proclaiming this kind of knowledge that was not based on uh, any kind of intellectual thing. It was just more of a spiritual knowledge, like, ooh, uh, you know, I have all this knowledge, you know. I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to, kind of hard to explain. Uh, but because of that false teaching that was beginning to come up, John is very 
uh, interested in emphasizing true knowledge of God. The word know, or some form of it, happens again and again and again throughout 1 John. So just be on the lookout as you go through. So he wants to give assurance to his readers that they have a true knowledge, not this mystical knowledge, but a true knowledge that they are in Christ. And he does this in this passage by identifying the marks of a true Christian. But first, he's going to acknowledge that there are some people who claim to be saved but are not. And so that's my first point today. Uh, the problem of false claims. One of the things we need to recognize as a reality in the Christian experience, and in particular in our churches, is there must be categories for authentic claims of faith and for false claims of faith. And by that, I just simply mean that not everybody who says, I am a Christian, is a Christian. Jesus talked about the kingdom would, be, uh, would grow to the end of the age with wheat and tares, uh, false wheat, until the harvest. And in the visible church, what we might call the visible church, and that's just simply this church here on this street corner, Steadfast Church over in Asheville, and every other church building and church gathering that you see, within all of those, there are going to be true Christians and false Christians. So let's look at how, how he points this out. There are three times in this passage, we're going to do a quick pass here, and then, then we'll dive back into it a little bit more. But in verses 4, 6, and 9, notice that there are three times that he says, whoever says. Verse 4, whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Verse 6 says, whoever says he abides in him, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And that kind of implies that some people don't do that. They say they abide in him, but they don't walk as Christ walked. Then in verse 9, we see it again. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. So just by saying, I'm in the light, I know God, I abide in Christ doesn't mean you do. And, and so John is, is aware that there, there are false claims of church. And he writes from uh, on the assumption and from his own experience that there will be false claims of faith. Now he talks about this a little bit later. Uh, if you've got your Bible, just flip over a page. I'm going to go ahead uh, a few verses. Go to chapter 2, verse 19. And here he's talking about some false believers and some false teachers, <coughs> which he calls antichrists. And uh, verse 19, notice the... I'm going to get a little nerdy here. Notice the prepositional phrases, all right? So we're thinking back to ninth grade English. Do you all do well with your grammar? Okay, here we go. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. So you can be with us, but not of us. And eventually, the truth is going to come out, and, and people leave, and they are no longer, uh, they, they've gone away from us because they're showing that they're not truly of us. You may have to read that again on your own and just kind of meditate on each of those phrases, but it's so, it's so critical. So John recognizes that there are, there are these false claims of faith. But he wants to assure the true believers. That's his point. Not to lay a bunch of guilt, and that's not my point today, to get you questioning your faith. 
My point is, if you are a true believer, I want you to be sure in your faith. So he does this. He identifies the marks of a true Christian uh, who can say, I know that I am saved. But before we get into that, I want to go backwards a little bit. And this is my second point. I want to give us a reminder of the ground of our salvation. And so as you had, I'm assuming last week, maybe uh, verses 1 and 2, let's look at that. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, this is the gospel message. And before we move on to instruction here about keeping commandments and loving the brotherhood and and, and so on, before we move there, we need to make sure we we stay connected to that gospel message. Uh, Let me give you an example from basketball. Um, Anybody, you know, like basketball? I mean, a few. Some of you, it's like, what? I don't know. It's... And then some of you are like, well, it's just not the way it was when I was young, and that's me. But anyway, a little bit of a rule thing about basketball. Um, If you are bouncing the ball, you can can walk about, okay? But if you are holding the ball, you can't do that. That's called traveling. Unless you're in the NBA and you're doing like a multiple step back to make a jump shot, but that's that's another sermon. Anyway. (laughs) If you, are, if you are holding the ball, you have to keep one foot in place. Now, the other foot can move around. This foot that stays in place, that's called the pivot foot. It can actually, it can do all kinds of things. It can, it can actually uh, spin, but it just can't move, uh, move from its spot. So, you know, if you're holding the ball and you've got defenders all over you and you're trying to, trying to find a place to where you can pass the ball to someone else, you can move this other foot to get out of their way, to, to do all these things, but you better not move that pivot foot. All right, this pivot foot is 1 John 2, verses 1 and 2. Keep your foot, keep your pivot foot in the gospel, in the truth of the gospel, that that Jesus Christ has come, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, rose again to validate his, his triumph over sin and death, and then ascended to the, to the Father where he reigns now, waiting for all of his enemies to be put under his feet. That's the gospel. That's your, that's your pivot foot. And so as you step out and as we step into to 1 John and start to talk about instruction and things to do, this is very important uh, for Christians because you could so easily get into, oh, right, now we're talking about keeping his commandments. And you're right back into law keeping and trying to do things to please God. But if you keep that pivot foot in the gospel, You stand flat-footed in the gospel. Now you can step out with this foot and begin to to think about the things that we need to do because of what Christ has done. So always remain tethered to what Christ has done. This is what we call the the indicatives of Scripture. That's another grammar term, by the way. Um, the things that just state what is true, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and, and all this is for us. We have been saved by Christ. We are being saved by Christ. We will be saved by Christ. It is all Christ and never ourselves. And this is the ground of your assurance. 
You have to remain firmly tethered to the gospel, standing flat-footed in the gospel, and then you can, you can explore what, what the Bible tells us to do while we, while we remain firm in what Christ has done. Are you trusting in the finished work of Christ? Then be assured. He is faithful. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He is the advocate speaking to the Father on our behalf. Joel Beakey uh, summarized it this way. The objective promise embraced by faith is infallible because it is God's comprehensive and faithful covenant promise. Now let me read that again. The objective promise embraced by faith is infallible because it is God's comprehensive and faithful covenant promise. So the first thing the first thing you need to do if you are struggling with assurance is to is to plant that pivot foot and plant it in the gospel and in the promises of the gospel. Fill yourself with gospel truths. Preach the gospel to yourself every day, and that's any truth that, that reinforces that salvation is of God and not of ourselves. Saturate your mind with divine promises Thomas Brooks, the Puritan, said, the promises of God are not only the food of faith, but also the very life and soul of faith. So if you are struggling with, with doubts and with, with um, anxiety about the state of your soul, the first thing you want to do is to plant yourself in the gospel and gospel truths. <coughs> but John goes on. And this leads us to our third point, and this is really the bulk of this passage. Number three, the comforting proof of our true conversion. Now, I want you to think back to when you first came to faith in Jesus Christ. In a sense, assurance is a part of that. It's, it's an integral part of saving faith to have assurance. After all, you hear the the gospel, and you hear God's promise that all who believe in Jesus Christ can have their sins forgiven. And you believe God, you consider him faithful who makes that promise. And so you put your trust in him, assured that what he says he will do, he will do. And so a measure of assurance is, is the very essence of faith in Christ. But in, in our experience, we often don't feel that assurance. But it's there. Saving faith never looks like giving it a try. I'm going to give this a try. No, you're going to believe the promises of God and trust in the finished work of Christ. That's more than giving it a try. But we don't always have full consciousness of that. It kind of ebbs and flows with our experience. It depends sometimes on um, whether we are attending to the, the reading and study of Scripture, whether we are attending to the fellowship of the saints, uh, things like the, the, the Lord's table. These are, these are means by which God confirms and assures us of His love for us. So maybe you've forgotten some of those things. Maybe you've left off some of those things. You don't pray like you should. These are all things that can make your, your assurance waver. But John wants to give us the marks of genuine faith. So let's look at these. Starting in verse 3, And we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Now we have to be careful here. 
the tenses of these verbs is, is exactly what it has here in the ESV. Some, of the, some other translations say, we know that we know him. But it's really, we know that we have come to know him. So at some point in your past, if you are a true uh, believer in Christ, we could say, you, at that point, you came to know Christ. You came to know God. Well, now we're talking about how do I know that that's really the case? And it, it says, if we keep his commandments. Be very careful here that you don't think that I have to keep his commandments in order to know him. That's not it. You came to know Christ by faith, apart from works. But you know that you know him by keeping his commandments. In other words, uh, there's a life change. People who come to Christ, their lives change. It's never perfect. It's in this life, it's always mixed with indwelling sin. Um, and, and as we saw earlier in 1 John, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. John has said that. If you say you're without sin, you're, you're, you're making him a liar, you know, and, and all of that. But we keep his commandments. In this passage alone, the word commandment or commandments happens six times. And one time it's talking about keeping his word, which means the same thing. This is pretty important to John. Think about what Jesus said in the Great Commission. He said, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them and teaching them to do what? Obey everything I've commanded you. Just think about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, his teaching. There are almost 50 ethical imperatives, commands in the Sermon on the Mount. Being saved by by grace, through faith, apart from works, does not ever mean that we don't do good works as a result. And this is John's point, that those who have come to know him can know this because they are keeping God's commandments. Verse 4, as we, as we read earlier, is kind of the counter of this. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Verse 5, but whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Now, how do we, what do we make of that phrase, the love of God? The love of God is perfected in us if we keep his word. Well, we could look at it as God's love for us or our love for God, but I, I tend to read this as in the sense of, the love as God loves is perfected in us as we love others. And, and that's going to be um, made more explicit in the latter part of this passage. That love for others is, is really, when we talk about keeping his commandments, uh, it's really loving, uh, loving the brothers and sisters, loving our enemies, it's loving our neighbor. Uh, verse 6 just simply restates the premise here, that whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he, Jesus, walked. Now John goes on to elaborate here and talk about love. Verse 7, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. This command... To love one another is as old as the Bible itself. Love God, love your neighbor. Jesus said these were the, the, it's interesting, those two commands are the single most important command in the law. They go, they go hand in hand. We read those in Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Leviticus 19, 18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. And then in Matthew 22, Jesus repeats those when he's asked, what's the most important command 
in the law. So it's not an old command, or it's, I'm sorry, it's not a new command, but it is an old command. But then John strangely says, um, well, he says, it's an old command that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. So they knew that. Now, verse 8, it is a new command. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Who's the true light? Jesus Christ. Okay, it's a new command in the sense that as Jesus came, he displayed for us really what it means to love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Well, then he tells the story of the, the Good Samaritan, and he, he uses uh, highly charged uh, ethnic and racial differences to kind of illustrate the point. He comes to us and says, love your enemies because um, what good is it to just love people who, who like you or who are like you? In that sense, it's a new command. Jesus has, has displayed what loving your neighbor is all about. And, and the highest point at which he did that was on the cross. Paul says, in this, God's love is shown that Christ Jesus died for sinners. He did not wait for us to clean up our act. He died for us when we were in our sins, when we were rebellious, and in that is love. So, what does this mean for us as far as our assurance is concerned? Well, the fruit of God's work in you, and this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about you trying to do a bunch of stuff to prove yourself that you're truly a Christian. We're talking about what's the fruit of the life that God has put, put in you. And your keeping of his commandments, and in particular, the commandment to love as Christ has loved is a clear witness to your salvation. It's proof that God is at work. Now, I don't want to lay a bunch of guilt on you over your salvation, as I said earlier. My point here, and John's point in 1 John, is, is not to increase your guilt, but to build your assurance. And he says... The gospel changes lives. And if there are people out there that say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and I, I've known people like this, and they just live as they please, they are proving that they are not truly saved. But has God worked in you? Have you seen change in your life as a result of Christ? Then be assured. Have you seen your love for neighbor both friend and enemy, grow, then be assured. And even if, it's, if it seems like the, the evidence is small at times, or that I'm not growing like I used to, sometimes people come to Christ and there's just an immediate, like, massive change, very visible. And then we settle down, and we don't see the change so much day to day. But I'm here to tell you as a follower of Christ for a long time. I won't, I won't tell you how long. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, you look back five years, you'll see the change. And that is, is evidence that I know him. I have come to know him. Zechariah says, do not despise the day of small things. If you see small indicators of growth, then that's an indicator of growth, and that's an indicator of God's fruit in your life. And sometimes we just simply have to say with John Newton, the, the former slaveholder, slave trader, um, who came to Christ and wrote for us that great hymn, Amazing Grace, he said, he said, 
He said this, I am not what I ought to be, but I am not what I once was, and it is by the grace of God that I am what I am. You can verify, as it were, your standing in God by seeing the fruit in your life. But I do want to add, just as an aside, um, I wondered if I should say this because it's just, it's just a little thing, but it, it, need, it, it need not go unsaid. Don't use these tests. First John, don't use these tests of true faith to judge others. Like, oh, I don't think this person's saved. She does this, this, and this, and she's not very loving. It's always funny to me that we judge other people by their fruit, and we judge ourselves by our intentions. But um, anyway... I'm just going to leave that there for you. But let's go back to the pivot foot. Let's close today with talking about that, that pivot foot, keeping ourselves tethered to the gospel, to the truth of the gospel. When you start thinking about obeying God's commands, so I'm going to do the image again. Here's my pivot foot in the gospel. And here's me over here trying to obey. And sometimes Satan comes and he, he accuses me. And, or sometimes temptation comes and I have, to, I have to move to get out of the way and I have to do all these things. Please don't try to read too much into this illustration, but um, you kind of get the picture. I have to keep flat-footed in the gospel. If I'm going to try to... In, in, in the power of Christ, if I'm going to endeavor to be more loving, to obey Christ's commands more faithfully, that's this, right? That should not change this. As soon as I step away, as soon as I break my pivot, what am I doing in basketball? I'm traveling. You don't want to be traveling away from the gospel here. What if I'm not growing? What if, I, what if I don't obey enough? I'm all worried about this. And you start to drag that pivot foot. Now you have doubts. Now you have anxiety. Be assured that as you see these evidences in your life, that this is speaking that you know that you have come to know. Brothers and sisters, I, wanna, I, I want you to be assured today that if you are in Christ, first of all, it's because you have, you have put your trust in the promises of God, God Almighty. And all the promises of God are yes in Jesus Christ. But then we see in our lives that the work that God began, He's going to continue to do. And He's going to change our lives. And there will be actual change. And we'll become more loving. We'll become more obedient uh, to Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, that gives you assurance. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these, these dear saints in this place. Thank you for Billy and, and the staff and their work, uh, pastoring, leading. Lord, I, I just pray for, for all of us here that we would uh, stay strong in the gospel and that we would bear fruit that speaks to the truth of your work in us. Be with us the rest of this service, Lord. I pray that it would build grace in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.